Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the webcast today entitled, How Hyper-Converged, Hyper-Secure is Your Organization. I'm Michael Rothschild, your host. We have lots of good content for you today that will undoubtedly bring new questions to the table, as well as hopefully answer some of the questions that you may already have. It doesn't matter what business vertical you're in, but we're all faced with the same challenges in terms of your infrastructure and, of course, your security. Today, I am joined by our speakers, Amit Jain, Senior Product Manager at Nutanix, and Arun Gowda, Vice President of Business Development at Vormetric. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. So for today, uh, we're going to cover a couple of different areas, and the agenda for today is to kind of talk about some of the trends and needs, some of the things that are keeping you up at night, as well as today's paradigm, both for, on the infrastructure side and the security side. Of course, you'll hear from our presenters about Nutanix and Vormetric, but more importantly, how together as a joint solution you can achieve hyperconvergence and hypersecurity. We'll have a summary at the end and, of course, give you a bunch of resources to follow up with. And without further ado, let us get started. I'd like to introduce you to Amit Jain. Sir, please proceed. Thanks, Michael. Well, before I talk about uh, the data center, hyperconvergence, and hypersecurity, I would like to take a step back and talk about how our normal day-to-day -day life has been made simple by technology disruptions. Well, most of us are always on the go, and taking cab has never been so easy with Uber, Lyft, and like companies. Now it is very well known how much disruption those companies are bringing to the taxi cab industry. However, a very important point to reckon is that Uber is not a cab company. So what is Uber? What are they? And the more you think about it, the more you realize that they are a technology company armed with a new business model. So here you see a trend, a company using IT systems expertise to disrupt something as mature as the taxi cab market. And this is not the only vertical this trend is becoming ubiquitous. You look at landing tree, what it is doing to the banking industry. You look at Airbnb, what it is doing to the hotel industry. And the common tenet is that technology is increasingly becoming a strategic enabler in every industry. And business leaders, they see this and they want technology platforms that can enable new business models quickly. And this is what attracts the business leaders to the public cloud. When they look at uh, AWS offerings from Google or Microsoft, what attracts them is the agility, elasticity, and cost transparency. No longer they have to size based on what their future needs could be. They can easily spin up or spin down based on their current demands and can figure out very easily what are the cost economics of running those workloads or scaling them up or scaling them down just at the point of a click. So it's very, very simplistic consumption model that everybody well understood and uh, it is very keen on latching onto. However, the public cloud does, is not uh, free of its own, uh, it's, it's not a free lunch. It does come with a set of concerns uh, and the concerns are more around the control, customization, and data privacy. If you have your on-prem data center infrastructure, you are very much in control, and you can provide tighter SLAs to your respective businesses. So you are in a complete control of that infrastructure. More importantly, if there are certain legacy workloads that need uh, customization, you can have a specialized infrastructure in your data center versus a cookie cutter approach that's provided in a public cloud model. So it, it provides you that kind of authority and uh, leadership that you can command onto your infrastructure. And more importantly, it's about security and data privacy. Well, there are certain industries where you cannot move to the public cloud because of data privacy and security reasons. And Arun from Romatric is gonna talk about it in a few minutes. But those are the very key concerns that 
business leaders have when they move to a public cloud infrastructure. And at a high level, that is the infrastructure dilemma. The traditional infrastructure is letting the customer choose between the two ends of the spectrum. Ideally, you want to have both. And that's the promise of hyperconvergence. And we at Nutanix pioneered that concept, and we are going to go along and talk about how we are simplifying the data center to make the consumption model still cloud-like, but still make you in control of that infrastructure. So with that, let me pass it over to uh, Arun and talk about why security and data privacy is so important. Over to you, Arun. Great. Thanks, Amit. Hi, folks. This is Arun Gatto from Bormetric. Yeah, so first let's address you know, why data security and privacy is important, specifically as it, as it pertains to sensitive data. I mean, sensitive data is proliferated, proliferated everywhere in a company, and uh, you know, a hyper-converged infrastructure like Nutanix is no exception. And if you think about sensitive data, what types of sensitive data are out there? So, uh, for example, it could be uh, patient health records, personally identifiable information, intellectual property, uh, customer private information, just a whole host of information that could be considered sensitive. And this sensitive data is typically under a couple of um, governance uh, mandates. The first is it's, if you think about compliance and regulatory requirements, so think of PCI or HIPAA or state regulatory requirements around protecting that sensitive information. That's one of the things to consider and why it's important because you're going to have to meet those requirements or else, you know, either pay a penalty or, um, you know, not be PCI compliant, et cetera. And the other one to think about is, as we've seen some recent headlines, um, there's a lot of uh, information out there that's very valuable. and and the, uh, so folks like uh, in rogue insiders want to steal the information, as well as malware and APTs that somehow find a way to get into your company, they'll exfiltrate sensitive data and use that for um, espionage pur purposes or to extract value from that information. So you have to protect yourself uh, from those types of attacks as well. So on the one hand, you, you need to meet all the uh, compliance and regulatory frameworks you've historically have had to meet. But on the other hand, what we've seen, again, and we've seen in, in quite a good uh, volume over the last year, is you have to be able to protect yourself against data breaches. And this includes both, again, rogue insiders or, or, or malware and APTs are trying to s steal that data. And again, it, it's, it's not all of the data, data they're after. It, it's really the sensitive data, PII, PHI, et cetera. So uh, we, we have to make sure that we're conscious of this and, and thinking about ways to protect that data. So now I'll forward it on to Amit. Oh, I'm sorry, this, this is me again. So what are some of the ways that folks are looking to protect data? So the first is, um, you know, one of the one of the things that is gaining very uh, gaining popularity is encryption. So encryption's been around a while, but as you can see, there's a there's a Ponemon Institute study that was done, and encry encryption is increasingly a, a way to protect that sensitive data um, from both um, uh, prying eyes and insider threats and uh, external threats, as well as being able to adhere to compliance requirements. And, and, and to kind of underlie that also is another study that was done by IANS, which showed that 84% uh, of uh, companies were implementing an encrypt everything strategy or, or encrypt all sensitive data. So again, sensitive data is sitting out in various places, including hyper-converged infrastructure, and companies know that you know, any one point of vulnerability could be a, a place where that information can be compromised. So increasingly, folks are looking at encryption, and again, because they don't want to be the next headline or they want to you know, uh, confirm, uh, conform to regulatory requirements. So I'm gonna, I'll pass this on to you now. All right, thanks, Aaron. So we talked about like what are the trends and the needs happening in the data center infrastructure, and now let me take a deep dive on explaining what is hyperconvergence and how Nutanix is trying to solve the complexity in the data center. Well, if you look at the traditional stack that exists in the data center, it's three tier. You have the networking layer from the likes of vendors. For example, Cisco, HP, or Star Brocade, or Juniper. And then you have the servers from HP, Dell, Cisco, or Lenovo. 
and you need the networking glue, which is a specialized uh, uh, networking glue. But before you connect, you need that networking glue to connect to the storage areas. You have it from the likes of EMC, NetApp, uh, HP, Dell, or Hitachi. And then, and then comes the networking substrate to connect those servers to those storage arrays. And these are fiber channel switches from Cisco and Brocade. And that's not it. You need specialized adapters from QLogic, Emulex to make this uh, functioning happen. So as you can realize, there are multiple vendors, multiple devices involved in spinning up this data center infrastructure. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because these are very specialized pieces of equipment, things that are so complex that independent companies exist to satisfy the need at each tier. And, and that's not it. That just constitutes your physical infrastructure. Building on the top of that, you need to have a virtual infrastructure, be it from VMware Hypervisor uh, or the Microsoft Hyper-V, before you can finally go to the app layer, which is where the true differentiation that you as a business can bring to the market. Uh, and those applications could be from Microsoft, Oracle, or SAP. But those are the key things that you really want to focus on and see from this picture the kind of layers that you really have to build on to really spin up that application. So, I mean, and I would write, like to draw a parallel with the converged systems like FlexPod or VPlock that exist and that try to provide that kind of convergence. But essentially, their stack also looks exactly like is shown in this picture. It is an old stack. What they tell you is that that particular switch would work with that storage array and with that firmware and so on so that you can deploy with a peace of mind. But essentially, there are still silos in your organization. There are still multiple vendors. There are still multiple storage devices that adds to the complexity. And what you really want to focus on is the app that really matter to your business. And it is this complexity which can lead to this reality. And uh, it's, it's not about what something has gone wrong in the data center or somebody is trying to uh, do something wrong in terms of misconfiguration or whatever. It's merely an expression of the complexity that exists in the data center. And how hyperconvergence can solve it, let's, let's look at it. So, we play, uh, you definitely need a networking infrastructure, uh, 10 gig in networking infrastructure from your uh, favorite vendors like Cisco or Extra Brocade. And we at Nutanix have converged the storage, the storage networking, and the storage array layer into a one single box, which is Nutanix, so that the physical infrastructure that you need to uh, have is minimized to absolute minimum. And on the top of it, definitely you need a virtual uh, hypervisor layer, which either could be from VMware or Microsoft. And what we have done at Titanic is that we have also stepped into the hypervisor boundary and tried to make it simple so that you don't have to worry about what's running underneath your applications. You can just deploy your applications in a cloud-like model without caring what's running underneath because we at Nutanix would provide that SLA that your applications are looking for. And, and this is the kind of simplicity that we have brought to the uh, data center. And most importantly, Nutanix architecture is a scale-out architecture which allows you to start small with a single, uh, like, uh, with a single cluster of, let's say, three nodes. And you can scale it forever depending upon how your workload is scaling up. And most importantly, the scale-out architecture abstracts out the pool of compute and storage, so it provides a consumption model which is simple and cloud-like, thus providing a truly invisible infrastructure so that you as a customer can focus on the business applications. And uh, this invisible infrastructure has built-in security. And the built-in security is based on three uh, tenets. The first is about self-healing and host security. 
we have made sure that Nutanix uh, architecture, Nutanix boxes are hardened by default, and it incorporates Nutanix defined stick baseline, which exceeds the uh, security baseline as set by Department of Defense. And most importantly, what you want to make sure that your system is secure going forward, not at just one point in time. So our system have a self-healing uh, framework which utilizes the salt stick uh, thing to identify any deviation from that baseline and the system would self-heal itself. So at any point in your system, your system would be compliant based on the settings, based on the baseline that was set uh, priority. And that is very, very important uh, as you progress in your data center journey evolution. And the second thing is about security forensics. We provide a real-time situational awareness of the threat landscape in your data center and try to simplify the root cause analysis and provide you some insights of what's really happening in the data center so that you can analyze and try to mitigate that risk. And the third point is about the data security and which is where we partner with vendors like Warmetric to provide that kind of resilience and security to the data center infrastructure. With that, uh, I will pass it on to Arun to talk about how we are leveraging that partnership and trying to unleash the security to the data center. Thanks, Amit. So yeah, so let's look at, so how do we encrypt? So there's essentially two categories of encryption and we'll focus on one, So, but we'll talk about both up front. So one is data in motion. So encrypting between devices or data in, as data is being transported from one device to another. And some typical ways to do this is SSL, SSH, IPsec, et cetera. And this is really data in motion. But the context where we're going to be talking about today is protecting data at rest because this is really the, the place where most of the, the breaches are happening when data is at rest, it's, uh, the data is being stolen or being compromised. So let's look at uh, some of the various ways that we protect data at rest. And if you look at a, a traditional stack, you have the application uh, slash database, you have a file system, and you have a disk, uh, disk level. And so essentially what we'll do is look at various uh, techniques to protecting uh, that data in, in that stack. <clears throat> So again, if, if, with, with the stack in mind, typically there's two trade-offs you're going to make when you're look, thinking about how do we protect and encrypt this data. So one is complexity. How hard is it to implement this? Am I going to have to make changes to my application or database? And then the other one is security. What, what type of threats and uh, what attack coverage, attack services is this, is this technique going to help me out with? So if you, again, if you look at this stack, there's actually <clears> – <throat> I'm going to blow this up here. So on the application database side, some very common techniques are uh, field level encryption, tokenization, data masking, et cetera. And then on the file system, it's file level encryption with access control. And then finally, you have full disk encryption, also called self-encryption drives. These are the various techniques that, again, are, are, are uh, used for this stack. And so if we look at the types of threats that these techniques help you protect against, <clears throat> Oops, go back one here. Apologize. So, so basically, you have uh, again, you have. So these are the type of threats that these techniques protect against. So if you start from the bottom up, so you have disk level protection or disk level encryption, that really protects against physical theft of the media. So if somebody steals the uh, the, the, the storage, then you know the, the, it's encrypted and you, and, and you don't have the keys to be, be able to unlock that data. And if you look at file system, file level, uh, file level uh, encryption, it really protects you against the both the Again, theft of the data as well as the insider threat, the privileged user and any APTs or malware that compromise privileged user accounts to exfiltrate data. And then uh, up top, you have application database. And this really, uh, the, the, some of the techniques we talked about to help protect against this type of attacks really help you against rogue DBAs as well as SQL injections. So if you look at this, again, these are various 
uh, levels of protection. And, and, and really, the trade-off is the complexity of the uh, of the implementation versus how much security you're going to get. So again, if you look at Vormetric, and we actually cover all of these use cases using various techniques. So for application and database, we have field level, app level protection, as well as tokenization. And for file level, uh, file level encryption, we have what we call Vormetric transparent encryption. And then we also do uh, key management for self-encrypting drives and full disk encryption technology, such as uh, the ones that Nutanix has. So essentially, this is our coverage with Nutanix, is both the, the transparent encryption as well as the key management. And if you look at the file, of file system encryption, um, and to some degree the disk level encryption as well, these typically cover 90% of the use cases and, it, and that allow companies to really deploy at a much lower cost and compli uh, complexity as well as get the most amount of protection out there. And um, this is, this is the, what we've seen from our customer set as well. So what I'm going to do on the next couple of slides is go into detail on the transparent encryption product as well as the key management uh, product as well and how we uh, help uh, augment the security features of, of Nutanix. So first, let's take a look at our tra Vormetric transparent encryption. Um, this, and again, this is, this is file level encryption. And the reason we call it transparent encryption is there's no changes to the application or the database. Um, so essentially, it's, it's transparent to the users. So if you look at this diagram on the, on this, on, on the dotted box here, uh, we actually have a typical workload. And so here you see, and this could be a Nutanix cluster. Uh, and it could be a, you know, a VM running in a Nutanix cluster. And that's, that's in the gray box here. And then if you have, you have three populations of users typically in a company, you have system level users or sys admins or root users, and you actually have business users. So let's take a look at some of the, the ways that transparent encryption can help uh, work, work and protect against that, the threat vectors. I'm going to go ahead and illuminate the slide here. So if you look, so, so there's two main components of the Vormetric architecture. So the first is our DSM, which is our data security manager. And you can think of it as a security policy manager as well as a key manager. And it houses the keys and the security policies. And the encryption is done at agents that would, would sit in, uh, in either a virtual or physical servers. So if you think of a Nutanix cluster, it's going to have a bunch of VMs. And so our agent would actually sit at the uh, guest OS of the Nutanix, uh, uh, Nutanix cluster and enforce the security policy. And what does that policy look like? Um, essentially, there's two main components of the policy. The first is, uh, do, you allow, uh, do you allow access to the data or, and, and do you uh, decrypt the data? So in essence, what you do is if you look at the population of users out there, so you have privileged users that you allow access to the data so they can do the data management job, but you don't allow them to view the file data. So in effect, you're blinding the data to privileged users, uh, allowing them to do their job, but you're, not, but you're not allowing them to see the file data. And this is really powerful because it helps uh, reduce the risk from root users and sysadmins that although have a legitimate uh, right to access the data shouldn't be able to view the data because they're not business users. So this really helps address that insider threat. And then if you have, you know, again, business, normal business users, DBAs as well as application users, they're allowed to access the data and uh, view it in the clear. So to them, it's transparent. Um, they don't, so when we talk about transparent encryption, it, you know, they, they have no idea, honestly, that, that this is working in the background because they have completed, uh, they, this, this will work like they've always a work for them. And then finally, if this data is out in the cloud, so if this workload could say is out in the cloud, uh, you can get the same level of protection against the cloud, cloud service provider admins as well, because they have administrators out there in the cloud. So again, you can, you can explicitly uh, allow, uh, define which cloud providers uh, and, and their sysadmins can either view data or just uh, access the data. And because the, the keys and the security policy is owned by the company, they have very tight control on, again, who can view and access the data, whether internally in their own data center or externally out in the cloud. And if you look at this agent, again, it's sitting, the reason we call it transparent encryption is it's sitting uh, below the database layer at the file OS layer that's connected to storage. 
And it's actually looking at every file of I.O. request and then applying this policy of do you allow access to it and do you decrypt it. So essentially, it, it, it's, it's, it's looking at every – and you can get very granular and define which which file file directory or array you want to apply this policy towards. So you can have a very tight uh, policy around who can view data and who can actually access data. And from a performance perspective, and this is a common question we get, you know, encryption, uh, people always say there's a, there's a price to pay for encryption. And while that's true, uh, you know, the, the industry's come a long way, especially for metric on optimizing performance. So we actually integrate with the Intel AESNI chipset that allows us to offload crypto and key management functionality to the CPU itself and it allows you some dramatic performance improvements. So typically we're, we're seeing single digit uh, overhead with respect to encryption. And uh, again, it's very transparent to the, to the end users, uh, to the business users as well, that this is happening in the background and it's giving you a great level of protection. And so essentially, what, what, so the other thing that's happening is we're capturing very rich audit data on, on these users as they come in and determining who's accessing the data, what they're doing, et cetera. And this is very useful for uh, reporting and security analytics. So we take all this data and we can feed it to the major SIMs out there, including ArcSight and uh, McAfee Nitro, uh, Splunk, um, uh, IBM QRadar, et cetera. So you can actually uh, take this data and use it for reporting purposes or for compliance. You actually can take the data and report against it, against uh, again, granular file level access of users. And then also from a security perspective, you can, you know, there's two events that are, are very interesting. So first is, suppose you have a privilege user that tries to come in and escalate their privileges to become a, a business user. We can detect and block that and send that alert off to a SIM because that's typically a security-related event. Or if you have an unauthorized user or unauthorized process that try, that's trying to access the data but they can't, that typically means that, again, some, some kind of uh, suspicious activity is occurring. We'll fire that data off to a SIM. So in, in, in a nutshell, with transparent encryption, what you're, what you're getting is – um, I got a slide that I'm not familiar with, uh, Michael, on the, on the screen. Yeah, it looks like the screen is refreshing for some reason. Okay. So apologize for this. Bear with us for a minute, please. Okay, so I'm just going to keep going in the interest of time here. So essentially, we talked about we talked about the uh, transparent encryption and and the level again. What you're what that's really buying you is um, protection from system level threats and below. And again, very easy to use. Uh, it's transparent and um, you know it's it's a flagship product for Vormetric, and it gets you three things: encryption, the the privilege user access control, and the rich audit log data to to apply security intelligence against, against and look for suspicious data. Um, and and, and it, if you take a, um, transparent encryption, one of the other things that this really complements from a Newtonics perspective is the ability to encrypted backups. So Newtonics has a very elegant way to do uh, backup data in, in, into the cloud. So essentially, what we, if, with our transparent encryption agent, what this allows you to do is, is send encrypted data to the cloud. So if you have a storage administrator that's responsible for backing up uh, data, again, you, what you can do is uh, they, they're not, they don't see the data, it's encrypted, but they can do the data management job. And because the data is encrypted and they're accessing it, they can actually, when they do the backups, they can send encrypted data to the cloud. So imagine a scenario where you need to back up your uh, data to AWS or Rackspace or what have you. Essentially, that data is encrypted, so you can uh, you can move from cloud provider to cloud provider without having really having to worry about data security. And you own the keys and the security policy, so you can explicitly determine when and under what conditions uh, somebody can see that data, including the cloud provider. 
And the other integration that we'd mentioned with Newtonix was the uh, integrating with their self-encrypting drives. And Newtonix natively, a Newtonix cluster, has the ability to do self-encrypting drives or full disk encryption. And again, this is encryption at the storage level where it's really the main use case is really good for physical theft. If somebody steals that, somebody steals that cluster, they won't have the ability to view the data. And it, one of the key components of enabling this is the uh, external key manager. So Newtonix, if, when you turn on self-encrypting drives, you still need an external key manager. And this is where Vormetric can come in. If you remember from a couple of slides ago, I talked about our data security manager, or DSM. This can act as an external key manager for Newtonix uh, SED technology. So in, es in essence, you have uh, an external key manager with Vormetric. And we, 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 talk, we talk to the Newtonix SEDs with a KMIP interface. KMIP, which is a, a common key management interface. So this allows you to have segregation of duty between the data and the keys, because if the data is compromised, the keys are still ex stored externally by the data security manager. And so you have nice segregation of duty there. So um, really, the, 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 the main difference is what is it you're trying to protect against? And that's where uh, the distinction between the two occurs.